Troubles just won't go away, and uh, today we're going to be, uh, we're talking about uh, a faith that works. Let's see, am I able to? There we go. Uh, a faith that works is uh, the name of this series, but the topic today is when troubles just won't go away. Uh, we are a troubled nation, but uh, I want to get down to a, a more practical level of everyday experiences. And to do that, I want to travel back in time just a few years ago uh, when I had this prized automobile. <laughs> I was a, a young pastor, okay? So this car was not brand new. You've noticed, okay, you've noticed. Uh, in fact, this, this car had been totaled out. And then it was put back together and put back into service by my brother who was a body repair man. And by the time I got it, it had a lot of miles on it. And it but, it, you know, I, I drove it everywhere. It was a pretty good car. Well, so I thought. Well, so one day, I'm driving my car to the church, and I notice it's getting a little hot. So I get to the church, and I try to open the hood. I pop the hood, and it won't open. I'm out there pulling, crying, shaking, reaching my hand. It won't open. So I said, okay, be that way. <laughs> you ever been like that? You know, a little frustration? Okay. Be that way. I go into church and said, I'll just fix it when I go home. I'll have tools here. I, uh, it's like it get the best of me. So at lunchtime, I decide, okay, I'm jumping in the car, and I'm heading home. And, and the way, I, I, I was at a, at a church that was just outside a lake. It was a man-made lake. There was a valley. They dammed up the one end uh, and uh, let the, the, the water, the creek that went through it, fill up the whole lake. And it was all these community, a suburban community around this lake. And so I'm down at the end where it's all dammed up. And so I got to go down the valley on the outside and I get down and it's like a highway. I'm going 55, 60 miles an hour and all of a sudden that hood decides it will pop open. <laughs> it, it, I mean, it really popped open. I slam on my brakes. I can't see a thing. I mean, if, if you've never had this happen to you, count your blessings. I mean, your heart races because you don't know what, you can't see a thing. So I stop, get out, and then I push that hood back down best I can. And then I did what anybody else would do because it wouldn't latch. I got on it and I started jumping up and down. I, I mean, I'm jumping up and down on that thing and finally get it latched. And so finally it is latched and, and uh, now I drive home. Well, as soon as I get home, I'm going to open it up, find out what's wrong with this thing. Guess what? I can't open it. Now I notice because, man, I was on top of it, jumping up and down on this thing, okay? And so so what, what, what did I do? I said, okay, it's going to be that way. I'm going to eat first, then I'll come back out. I come back out. I got my tools. I, pry, I can't get this thing open. I said, oh, it's really shut. I got a meeting to get to. So I said, okay, I'm going to jump in the car. I jump in the car. I'm headed back to church. And I see the place where, I'm just, just where the whole thing happened. I'm kind of smiling and laughing. And all of a sudden, guess what happens? Yeah, there it goes again. The whole, whole, whole thing uh, pops open, and I cannot see a thing. I mean, I slam on my brakes, and guess what the drill is? Okay, I get on the outside of that thing, put it down, and there I am again, jumping up and down. All the community people are on this, watching this Baptist preacher at the side of the road, jumping up and down on his car, and it was just one of those troublesome days. You know, sometimes your troubles just won't go away. I should have known better a few years prior to that. <clears throat> I'd pull my car into the bank, parked it in the parking lot, had my son with me. He was like five or six years old. We go into the bank, and uh, while we're standing at the bank, they said uh, over the speakers, there's an announcement. Uh, uh, someone who has a station wagon, uh, there's smoke pouring out from under the hood of your car. My son tugs at my leg and says, Dad, Dad, we have a station wagon. I said, oh, no, 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 it's a hatchback. So I go ahead and finish my business transactions. Sure enough, I go outside and, and, and for some reason my clickers, I click and okay. It's, and all of a sudden there's smoke everywhere pouring out from underneath the hood of my car. And so, of course, what do I do? I go over and I open the hood and sure enough, I mean, it is just pouring like crazy. A, a vacuum line had fallen across like the alternator and it was burning down. It was shorting everything out and it was burning all the rubber off of the wires in the car. So I go, because I'm a poor pastor at this time, you know. I go to, uh, I go to a hardware store, 
get a roll of black electrician's tape. Wrapped all my wires. <laughs> Kept on driving that car. Hey, I, I, one winter, it's like 20 below zero. And, and it's really cold. And I said to my dad, because my dad had come down to visit us, I said to my dad, I said, Dad, I said, I probably should check the antifreeze on that car. He said, okay. So we go out, and, and uh, I go to open that back hatch, put the key in, I put my foot on the bumper, give it a little pull because it, it was stuck. You know how, you know how in the wintertime, it, the, the moisture underneath the seals freezes? Well, it was stuck, and so I put my foot on there, and I gave it a pull. Nothing happened. I gave it a pull. I said, Dad, I'm going to really have to pull this thing. Put my foot on there. I pulled, and sure enough, I pulled the back hatch completely off. It broke the hinges. I'm standing there. I'm holding the hatch. And I said, Dad, I'm sure glad you're here because nobody's going to believe I ripped this off. <laughs> I mean, so I, we had the next day, we went and had to buy new hinges so we could get the back hatch back on. Well, I did test it. My antifreeze was just fine. <laughs> troubles. You know, when, when, when I had those troubles with that car, you know, when, it, when the hood opened up and I went into lunch that day, my wife had said to me, so, well, how's things going? I said, oh, if I owned a gun, I'd go up there and shoot that car. You know, some days your troubles are just, th that's life, that's troubles. Troubles come your way. James is about that. What do you do when your troubles just won't go away? They just won't go away. When I jump into the book of James, uh, I see that you have to take some biblical countermeasures. And the, the first thing I want to notice as we go into this book and we'll do an introduction to it is that James is a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ he's actually the Lord's half brother okay Joseph and Mary had other children Jesus is conceived by the Holy Spirit and Mary so it's, they don't share the same father God the father is Jesus his father and, and so he's a half brother and not only is he a half-brother, but he is an unbeliever during his whole life while, while he's, Jesus is alive. Uh, in fact, it tells us in John chapter 7, verse 5, that he did not believe in Jesus. He is a witness to the resurrection. After Jesus raises from the dead, he appears to James. Guess what happens? Come on, if your brother had died and appeared to you alive, would you believe of course he becomes a believer. Not only does he become a believer because of the resurrection, he becomes on the day of Pentecost, he is one of those who is waiting for the Holy Spirit. He's listed among that number. Not only that, but he arises to become a leader in the church in Jerusalem. Some people consider him to be the pastor of the church at Jerusalem. And at one point it grows in excess of 15,000 members. He becomes a huge leader in the church. But I notice what it says here in this text, that he is a servant of God. The word servant would be better translated slave. He says, I am a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some uh, theologians would argue that he's referring to the same, that he's calling his brother Jesus God. Because he's become a believer. Jesus is God come in the flesh. His brother that he was raised with was God all along. He was just an unbeliever. I, as I go on a little bit further, he says he's identified himself as the writer of this letter. I was a disbeliever and I became a believer. And it was the resurrection of Christ that did so. I'm writing to the 12 scattered, 12 tribes of Israel. They had been scattered throughout the whole, whole world. Back in the days of, of the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonian Empire, the Jews had been scattered everywhere. But on three occasions during the year, they would come back to Jerusalem. And, and he's writing saying, to those who are scattered everywhere, scattered. I notice the Bible doesn't say sheltered. You know, the people of God aren't always sheltered from the troubles in this world. We're not. We go through them just like everybody else. He doesn't say sheltered. He says they've been scattered among the, the nations. That to me sounds a lot like they've got some troubles. If you've read the little book of Esther, you know they ran into troubles. Okay? And so... There is trouble. In fact, in this passage, it calls it trials of many kinds, testing of your faith. Per, the person who per, perseveres under trials, uh, who has stood the test. We've got these expressions, trials and testing. I would say that always equals trouble. Trouble. And they're not alone. You have troubles. I have trouble. 
And so what do you do when your troubles just won't go away? Well, James addresses this. He says, first thing you do is you take biblical countermeasures, and the first biblical countermeasure that you want to take is you need to rejoice. Now, this is not uh, what you'd really expect. Wait a second. My car is giving me problems, and I'm supposed to be happy about this? Rejoice? Count it pure joy? He says, this is a mental thing. Consider it. Not necessarily an emotional thing. In fact, what you think is supposed to control your emotions. Are you aware in the Bible it tells us always, therefore, wherefore, hence, whence, all these kind of things that are logical, sequential things. It never tells you to do it because you feel like it. Your feelings are to follow what you do. If I do what is right, I will eventually feel good. If I will rejoice in my troubles, I will still, I will later feel good. But if I complain and if I, whatever I do, get angry against my troubles, if I do that, I won't have any joy. So the first thing he says here is consider it pure joy, brothers, whenever you face trials of any type. Now I notice he says whenever because you're going to do that. He doesn't say if you do. It's just a matter of time when you're going to have a problem. You're going to have a difficulty. You're going to have a trial. You're going to have a test. You're going to have a tribulation. He says when you face them of many kinds. Now I talked about a circumstantial. The righteous person faces many troubles. I like the second part of this verse. But the Lord comes and rescues them each time. When do you trust in the Lord? When do you trust in the Lord? We all have circumstances that cause us problems and difficulties. They're going to come. Not only are there circumstances, but there are relational troubles that we go through. <laughs> Every now and then, you know, a person thinks that if I get married, all my problems will be solved. Are you kidding? The Bible says, but those who marry, not might face, they will face many troubles in this life. I always like at weddings, I hear the preacher say, you know, now that you two are together, he says, you have cut in half all your problems. Are you kidding? You didn't cut them in half. Well, they say, because you got somebody to share them. No, you just doubled them. Because you just took theirs on too. Are you kidding me here? The Bible says, listen, your relationships are going to have troubles. Not just marriage. You're going to have troubles with your kids. You're going to have troubles with grandkids. You're, hey, listen, there's relationship troubles out there. That's what he's saying. He goes on here in the passage and says, all right, there we go, physical. You might have some physical problems as well. I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. He said, listen, Paul had bad eyesight, he might have had malaria. He had the same kind of physical obstacles in his path that you and I have. We're, we're in, a, in a cursed world, sin-cursed world, and, and our, our bodies are experiencing the curse. They're, they're running down. You know, we, we, we try to fool ourselves. We get better with age. Well, the body is telling me, oh, no, you're not. You're winding down, buddy. You've been winding down since the day you got bored. Listen, we all have physical problems and challenges and difficulties. There's financial. Some people have more financial troubles and problems than others. But listen, he says, I know your affliction and your poverty. There are times, I mean, there's, there's no guarantee that you're not going to get a pink slip tomorrow and be in, in a crisis situation. There's no guarantees. I, I, the troubles are just about anywhere. There's spiritual troubles as well. The apostles were preaching the gospel. Is there anything more noble than that? And then they were incarcerated, and they called the apostles, and they flogged them because they were preaching in the name of Jesus. And they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then they let them go. And the apostles left the Sanhedrin, who were responsible for all of that, rejoicing. Why? They had considered it all joy. What? Because they had been counted worthy of God to suffer disgrace for the name that stands for Jesus. 
they had the right attitude, even in flogging, getting beaten, they considered it all joy. Oh, this is something. Consider it pure joy. And the answer is why? Why would we do that? Why in the world? Because it's a test of your faith. It's a test of your faith. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. God gives everyone tests. Abraham was the friend of God, and he had perhaps the most severe test of anyone I know in the scriptures. God said, he was testing Abraham, said, go offer your only son Isaac. And he did. He took his son and said, hey, listen, God wants us to go worship on Mount Moriah. Get some wood, get the donkey. They went, and uh, Isaac wasn't a dummy. He said, listen, I see we got fire here, we got wood, we got the altar. Uh, hey, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And then Abraham bound him up. He showed a willing part on Isaac's part because he's a teenage kid at this point. And he lays down, and when he's about to slay his son as a sacrifice on the altar, God says, whoa, whoa, stop, hold it. And there's a ram caught in the thickets. And God said, now that I know that you truly believe, Take the ram in the thickets, sacrifice it, and let your son go. Listen, I don't think I could have passed that test. Here's the interesting thing about it. There's several tests of Abraham in the book of Genesis. There are no more tests for Abraham after this one. No more recorded temptations, tests of his faith. He passed with flying colors. God saw he trusted in the Lord. It's a test of your faith. Notice that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Now the question is, what is perseverance? It means the ability to remain strong under pressure. I got this guy, he's under pressure. <clears throat> There's a pressure, you know, like when my car was causing me all the problem, not to get angry and actually go get a gun and shoot the thing. <laughs> you know how, how we get. Uh, uh, there's, there's the pressure in a marriage relationship not to get angry and make threats and idle threats that, that just go down a spiral, down, downward way, leads to divorce. It's the ability to remain strong under pressure. When I have a test of my faith and I remain true to God, it strengthens me. For the next time there's a trouble. God got me through it before, he can do it again. It strengthens my faith. And so it says God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted, have a test or a trial or a trouble beyond, beyond what you can bear. He never put, allows more pressure into your life than you can handle. That's a promise of God. He's faithful to make sure that you never have more than you can handle. I, I hear people all the time say, I just can't handle this. And I want to say, oh yes you can. But the truth is, is you don't want to handle it. Because God has limited it so you can handle it. There's never more in your life than you can handle. The apostles said, whoa, God really considered me to be able to handle a lot. He flogged me for his name. Whoa, God has really confidence in me. You see the attitude? It's all about attitude. It develops perseverance. <clears throat> That's the second point. When troubles just won't go away, you rejoice. But secondly, you persevere. You stay under the pressure. Because perseverance, he says in verse 4, <clears throat> must finish its work. Now the question is, what work? Well, it <clears throat> must finish its work <clears throat> so that you may be mature and com <clears throat> complete. Not lacking anything. Three works of completing us. His work for us is salvation. First thing I got to do is be saved. I need to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior from my sins. I need to have that faith encounter where I call upon Him and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. You are the Savior. I'm acknowledging my sin. Save me from my sin. And when He does, He wipes away the whole penalty and you are saved forever. Eternally secure. That's His work for us. Jesus died on the cross, took my place, was a substitute. I experience his salvation. The second one is his work in us. 
You see, he continues to work in us and sanctify us. Every day when I use that same faith to trust in Christ, and when I did when I got saved, I put my faith in him. Every day when I put my faith in him, in the daily routines of life, that I become more and more like Jesus. I walk more and more like Jesus. I talk more like him. I, I, I have a heart more like him. That's the work of sanctification. That's his work in me, changing me. If any man's in Christ, he's a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. Something new's coming out of me. That's his work he's completing in me. It starts with salvation, continues in sanctification. And then there's his work through me. He's given every one of us a purpose. When my purpose is done, God's going to take me out of this world. It's just the way it is. When my purpose is complete, I'll be done. As long as I'm in this world, I still have a purpose to complete. And that's service. I serve him. I serve him. I serve him. He's saying when you persevere, and you, you, you face troubles, and you're handling them, you're persevering them, you're going to be able to turn around and help those who are going through the same thing. You've got service to do for God. Third thing you do when troubles just won't go away is you pray. You pray. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God. You know what we mostly ask for? God, take this away. God, get rid of my pain. God, take the cancer away. God, pay my house bill payment. God, whatever it is, fix the flat tire. I don't know, whatever, whatever it is. God, you know what he says to pray for? wisdom we're praying that God will solve the details and he says no 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 pray that I will give you wisdom so you'll know how to handle the situation God wants us to handle situations why do you think God gave you an intellect why do you think he gave you a, a will and why does he why do you think he gave you self-determination why did he put a book in the Bible called Proverbs saying, hey, if you want to be wise, you live like this. Here's a way to live so that you would use wisdom. And he says, listen, if you lack the wisdom, hey, just pray, ask God, and he will actually give it to you generously. You'll get more than you need. You'll know, later say, man, I can't believe I came up with that solution to that problem. He goes on and he says, without finding fault, God's not going to say, oh, you blew it. You figure it out. He will grant you the wisdom to figure out what to do so that you can face your troubles, your trials, your problems. It says that it will be given. God will give it. God will give it. This is a promise of God. I just pray. When I got troubles, I pray. And then I, I look for, okay, God, you're going to bless me with wisdom to know what to do. And you've got to act on it. The next thing it says here is when troubles just won't go away, you believe. But when the person who's got troubles asks, he must believe and not doubt. Thomas was truly troubled. Jesus had died. The Savior had died. He wasn't there when Jesus appeared resurrected. And everybody's telling him, Jesus is alive. And he says, I don't believe it. I doubt it. He had heard Jesus say, destroy this body in three days I'll raise it up I mean he was there he was a disciple but he doubted he doubted he said unless I put my finger in the nail prints of his hand and in his side I won't believe and then Jesus appeared to him and said okay go ahead put it right in there buddy he says blessed are you because you believe and you've seen but blessed even more blessed are those who have believed and have not seen he says believe and do not doubt. The person who doubts is like the waves of the sea, blowing back and forth, tossed to and fro. There's nothing steady, nothing foundational there. And then he goes on and he says, that man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. You're not getting anything from the Lord if you doubt. I am amazed at how many times I pray, and then afterwards, and God answers, and I say, man, I can't believe that, oh, I should have believed. When I say I can't believe, I'm saying I was doubting when I prayed. I didn't really, I had no expectation. What I should be praying is say, man, I am amazed at how quickly the Lord answered that prayer. Not that I can't believe it. Because I should be believing. Man should not think he'll receive anything from the Lord if he doubts. He goes on here and he says, that man who doubts is a double-minded man. 
the Greek here is he's a double-souled person. He's got two souls. He's a double-minded person. And that double-minded means he's going in two directions. A year, I, I, I worked in ministry for years with a divorce recovery. I'll tell you right now, whenever there was a third person in the picture, you could never bring harmony back to the original marriage. Because the person who had two people in their lives was a double-focused person. And as long as you got double, well, you're being tugged two directions, you can't fix the one you're in. You can't do it. It's impossible. A double-minded person is unstable in all their ways. And when you say, I believe in God, and then you're acting like you don't, you're a double-minded person. You say, I'm going to trust God for this, and then you don't. You're a double-minded person. You'll be unstable. Notice what it says. In all he does. Not just in that. Everything is unstable in the life. Because you're not focused on what you should be focused on. The Lord. Now the next thing is you need to take pride. Take pride. The brother is in humble circumstances. You've been humbled uh, by life. You, whatever your trouble is, it's humiliated you. He needs to take pride in his high position. I, I am a believer in Christ. Jesus is the joy of my life. You, you take pride that, that you're a Christian. He said, and on the flip side, he says, but the one who is rich, he should take pride in his low position, even though I'm blessed financially. Hey, I need, I'm, I, I'm spiritually, I'm impoverished. I need the Lord. I need the Lord. There is a common denominator between all these things. Why would this person take pride in, this, in the low, low estate, the high estate? And why would we do that in all humility? He goes like this, because he will pass like a wild flower. <laughs> all these wild flowers here. For the sun rises and will scorch with heat and wither the plants and the blossoms will fall and its beauty will be destroyed. This life is so short-lived. He goes on, he says, there's an equalizer to everyone, the high and the low. In the same way, the rich man will fade away while he goes about his business. I've done quite a few funerals. I've never done a funeral yet where the hearse had a U-Haul trailer following it. You can't take a thing with you. You can't take a thing with you. It's not the one with the most toys wins. You don't. It's the one with the greatest faith. Your faith is everything. It's your connection to God. It's a life that is lived in faith so you get the reward from the Lord. You see, we take pride not in all the stuff, my low position, my high position. It's all about Jesus. Jesus is what matters. Living for Jesus is what matters. He goes on here and he says, hey, when, when troubles just won't go away, go for the crown. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials. You've got trouble, but you hang in there for God. Because when he has stood the test, like Abraham, you stand tall, you, you've stood the test. The pressure is on, but you've stood. He says, he will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who loved him. If you love him more than your life, see, it's, it's also called the martyr's crown in the book of Revelation. Those who have been martyred for Jesus are given the crown of life. Those who have been tempted and overcome the temptation get the crown of life. Uh, those who's got troubles in their lives, and rather than falling on the arms of their own flesh, but trust in God, they get the, the, the crown of life. He says, go for the crown. Go for the crown. You see, you can only rejoice in your troubles. You can only persevere through your troubles. You can only pray through your troubles. You can only be steadfast against your troubles. You can only take pride within your troubles. And you can only be triumphant over your troubles one way. You must believe. You must believe God alone is, in, is, is your true joy. I'm doing it all for Jesus. I'll endure anything for Jesus. I'll, I'll, I'll do it all for Jesus. That he is in control of your circumstances. He's not allowed anything to enter my life that I can't handle. He will answer my prayer for wisdom. 
He'll give me what I need to know to figure this out. I believe that. He will sustain me when I don't think I can carry on any longer. He promised he'll sustain me. He will lift you up in his time and he will reward your faith. When you believe that, even when your troubles don't seem to go away, you can conquer them. You can conquer them. You can conquer them. And so I just want to wind down here and say, put your faith to work. Believe. 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 Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word and the power of it, and the message in it. And we're going to face troubles and difficulties. Some will face them this week, some a little later, but we all will face them. When we do, help us, Lord, to reflect back upon this passage and your instruction, to consider it pure joy that you counted us worthy of that trouble so that you can sustain us and you can receive all the glory of how you get us through it. Bless us now, Lord, with perseverance in our lives, great faith in our hearts, so that we have a faith that really works. In Jesus' name, amen.